Hi, y'all. This is Mike with uh, Dronester Teaches, and we are doing our Thursday night Zoom again. Um, we are going to actually be doing a. Oh, let me put my head. We're going to be doing live by line dissection of uh, the uh, uh, format. What we're going to do is we're just going to read the book of Ezekiel. We're going to read the chapter, and then we'll go back to the beginning. So we'll read straight through the chapter, so everyone has a flavor. And then we'll come back and Anthony and I are going to, we're going to go line by line. We're going to say stuff that pops out to us, look at things in each verse individually. So that by the end of this, I estimate if we can do two chapters a night, it'll take 22 weeks to complete this. By the end of this, there will be a very in-depth uh, analysis of Ezekiel, kind of like a Chuck Misler commentary. Um, I mean, Chuck Misler did his in... Uh, 24 one hour sessions we might be able to do it in 22 one hour sessions especially with anthony and i uh tag teaming it um but that's our goal here is to um i i personally would like to make it through every single book in the bible and have on this youtube channel a commentary where we dissect and go into the historical mathematical grammatical um astronomical data that's associated with it and have a really maybe not the best put together, not as well put together as a Chuck Misler commentary, but hopefully it has just as much information. Um, so that's our goal here. Uh, and we're going to be doing that tonight. Um, mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Heather uh, pray us in, and then I'm going to do a slight introduction of Anthony. Um, uh, you guys are all, obviously anybody that's been watching for a while um, will know who Anthony is. Uh, but for anybody that's coming and viewing this Ezekiel commentary that doesn't, that maybe doesn't know the channel or doesn't know this Zoom, um, I'd like another, I'd like a short little introduction of Anthony. That way you guys can be familiar with him so that you'll understand who is speaking when we're doing these dissections. Uh, but Heather, why don't you go ahead and uh, pray us in and then we'll do our little introduction for Anthony. Okay. Lord. We just praise thy holy name and we thank you so much for your love and care. It's just awesome. Lord, we ask your blessing on this meeting and thank you to, for the ability to get everyone together like, like this and to learn your word together. Just speak through the people that are talking. Give Michael and Anthony knowledge about what to say and what you want us to learn. Open our minds so that we understand what's being said. Let this all bring us closer to you and to your word and to your will, Lord. And it's all for your glory, Lord. So we, we do put this meeting in your hands and we praise your holy name. In your son's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Awesome prayer. Uh, thank you, Heather. That's awesome. Okay, Thanks. so now we're going to do a short little introduction. Uh, my name is Michael Trone. I have a background in physics, uh, astronomy, um, chemistry, and then I dabble in a lot of the other types of sciences as well. Um, I've done some electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, so on and so forth. So I just have a slight background. I have no degrees. Just want everybody to understand this. I have no degrees. Um, I don't have a doctorate in theology. Um, I don't have any accreditation to myself whatsoever. I just want everybody to understand that, that if you're looking at this to be a scholarly assessment, I would think that it is a scholarly assessment, but I do not have any scholarly credentials. So let's make that, let's get that up front right now. Like Peter was called to be a fisher of men with no credentials other than he was a fisherman. Um, and then look at all the things that he did. Um, so I'm not a, I'm not a Paul. Um, I don't have massive amounts of schooling behind me, but I do have some okay understanding, I think. Um, and as, as you go through the study, you'll, you'll be able to see that I can understand some things. I'm, 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 I don't wanna toot my own horn, but I can understand some stuff. Um, and with me, when we do these dissections, um, are all of the, the people that are in the Zoom. So we have Heather Pinkston, we have um, Rhonda, um, we have Whitney here with us, but the other person that's gonna be doing the dissection with me is Anthony Gonzalez. And so I'm gonna go ahead and give the floor to you, Anthony, do a little short introduction of who you are. Oh, hi. Yeah, my name is uh, Anthony Gonzalez and um, I'm a friend of Michael Tron and the group 
that is here and um i'm part of uh a new covenant uh uh crossover ministries uh church um and i'm a minister there and uh i've been serving the lord uh since i was uh i believe seven years old i my mom took me to a baptist church so um and i've went through many churches uh throughout my life growing up um some of them have closed down uh due to uh spiritual attacks um four of them to be exact or my first one was a baptist one and it went down and uh they did for tax evasion and um but it's just all shows you that uh um there's a spiritual war out there and you have to be uh armored up at all times be ready and know what the enemy because he's coming at you not all the time but in seasons and if it's the season you got to be ready so yeah just uh wanted to just share that but yeah it's my name and uh um i just want to share what uh god has put on my heart thank you anthony okay so now we're going to go ahead um we're going to get prepared for the study so i'm going to give a little bit of historical background on the book of ezekiel um Ezek, uh this is just for flavor for anybody that uh, that wants to know this but ezekiel is a prophet that was called in um jerusalem and let me go wrong way i don't know why it muted there we go okay so ezekiel is a prophet that was in jerusalem he's around the same time as nebuchadnezzar 605 to 562 bc nebuchadnezzar who is an absolute despot of the babylonian king um thrived he sacked every city that you could imagine everything was under his control he was one of the um so antediluvian means pre-flood right so antediluvian um or, or either pre-flood or around where the the flood is nebuchadnezzar would be considered a post antediluvian babylonian king whereas uh, nimrod would technically all of the fables that are associated with nimrod he would be right around the time of the flood so what we're talking about is the few thousand years after the flood um now nebuchadnezzar is a post antediluvian king of babylon he sacked jerusalem he sacked uh, pretty much everybody that he came up against he was during the time of a egyptian pharaoh known as pharaoh necho pharaoh necho was a rival of nebuchadnezzar's nebuchadnezzar sacks jerusalem when he sacks jerusalem the first time he does it three times when he sacks jerusalem the first time he takes with him a bunch of captives from jerusalem daniel who is a contemporary of um ezekiel uh was taken from jerusalem and taken into babylon and, and essentially rose to be second or uh third ruler in babylon third ruler being the um second ruler meaning he was directly under nebuchadnezzar and then during the time of belshazzar when the writing on the wall the hand writing on the wall he was made third ruler in the kingdom by belshazzar because belshazzar wasn't actually the king he was a vassal king under his grandfather when it says that he was a son of Nebuchadnezzar, this is true, but also untrue at the same time. He wasn't a direct son of Nebuchadnezzar. He was a removed grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. So he was uh, very, very long after we're talking more than 10, 15 years after Nebuchadnezzar had reigned. So there were other kings that were put over Babylon uh, after Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar sacks jerusalem he takes with him daniel and he leaves some of the priests and the priestly people in jerusalem and sets himself a vassal king who was known as jeconiah jeconiah ends up getting a blood curse put on him by god um, and another vassal king is set up in place by nebuchadnezzar after jeconiah is taken out and this is jehoiachin and jehoiachin again rebels against nebuchadnezzar nebuchadnezzar for the uh under the third sacking of jerusalem says i've had enough and levels the entire place this all takes place between uh 562 and 605 bc um ezekiel essentially we don't really know exactly when ezekiel lived we can roughly date based on things that we find in uh, found in jerusalem babylonian history 
um, and some cuneiform uh, and Akkadian that was written at the time of Nebuchadnezzar that shows that Ezekiel was a prophet at this time in Jerusalem. He was told to do some amazing things, wonderful things, um, things that you and I would not imagine to do. Like uh, I'll give you an example. He was told to lay on his side for over 300 days in front of the temple. We don't know if he was in a house. We don't know where he was specifically. We don't know if it was a house that was there or if he was actually laying in the street in front of the temple of Jerusalem. But he, over 300 days, he was told to go down and lay on his side. We don't know if it's consecutive. We don't know if he just laid there for 300 days or if he was told to lay there for a specific time as a message to the people that were in Jerusalem. Um, now, all the prophecies that were given by Isaiah are actually fulfilled. Um, most of the prophecies, the historical prophecies of the sacking of Jerusalem that are given in Isaiah are actually fulfilled during the time of Ezekiel, um, including the prophecy of King Cyrus coming and sacking Babylon. Um, in, in, a, in, in Isaiah, the prophecy actually names King Cyrus by name 100 years before King Cyrus came to Babylon. So, um, yes, Ezekiel is a book from a very intense time in biblical history. Uh, we have during this period, just after or just before the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, we have the book of Esther is written. Um, you know, a lot of people will, will try to say that Esther is, is fake or false or any of this type of stuff. Uh, uh, whatever you think, it, do, it doesn't really matter. The book of Esther is in the Bible. And if, it's, if anything is in the Bible, it was by God's hand. You have to understand that. For you to say that a book is put in the Bible that is outside of God's hand means that you are saying that God's hand isn't on everything and he is not omnipotent. Because if his hand is not on everything, he is not omnipotent. If there is something that is outside of God's control, then you have therefore said God is not God. So if the book of Ruth is in the Bible, it's there for a reason. It's the ordainment of God. Every good and bad thing that happens to you is by the ordainment of God. Um, yes, our decisions play a factor in when or if we get blessings or curses, but everything is by the appointment of God. So Book of Ruth is around this exact same time. Um, Ezekiel uh, basically stays in Jerusalem while Daniel and his contemporaries are taken to Babylon. And when he stays in Jerusalem, his message to them in Jerusalem, similar to the message of Jeremiah, is this place is going to be destroyed and you need to just go ahead and take your 70 years of take your 70 years of captivity and they didn't want to do that and so they ended up having to run 70 years and then another 70 years there there was the set there was the destruction or the desolations and the captivity of jerusalem uh so they end up staying in captivity for quite a long time. Um, after the sacking and they're allowed to go back, they're still in vassal captivity. And so even after they were allowed to go back and rebuild Jerusalem, this group of people still had another 70 years where they were not ruling themselves. They were still under the uh, assumption of the Persian kings who sacked Babylon. So a little bit of history on Ezekiel. Now we're going to go ahead and get into the book itself. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share. And we will read through the first chapter. Oh, you, hold on. Before I do that. YouTube sucks, um, and it is just going to continue to send me notifications while I'm doing the study if I don't shut it up. So I have to do that real quick. Sorry, I did not do this before. YouTube. Come on, why is it out? YouTube, okay, here we go. Notifications, turn off. Thank you. All right. We're good now. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and screen share and we're going to go to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to read chapter one. Um, go ahead and screen start now. There we go. Okay. So 
Ezekiel chapter one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just read this through. Uh, just to get it out of the way, and then we'll go ahead and go back, and Anthony and I are going to take turns, basically just going line by line and really digging into the meat of what is said. Okay, so the book of Ezekiel chapter 1. Now it came to pass in the 13th year, on the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chabar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river Chubar. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its midst like the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also from within it, came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each had four faces, and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went. But each one went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of, each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. And each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side. And each of the four had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces. Their wings stretched upward. Two wings of each one touched one another. And two covered their bodies. And each one went straight forward. They went wherever the spirit wanted to go. And they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals on fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. Now, as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their workings was like the color of beryl. And all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was, as it were, a wheel in the midst of a wheel. When they moved, they went towards any one of the four directions, and they did not turn aside when they went. As for their rims, they were so high, they were awesome, and their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. When the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went, because where the spirit went and the wheels were lifted together with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. Then those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up together with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. The likeness of the firmament above, the heads of the living creatures, was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. And under the firmament, their wings spread out straight, one toward another. Each one had two, which were covered one side, and each one had two, which covered the other side of the body. When they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult, like the noise of an army. And when they stood still, they let their wings down. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. Whenever they stood, they let down their wings. And above the firmament, over their heads was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was the likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also, from the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around it. Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one speaking. Okay, so now we are going to go ahead and um, go line by line on this. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and reread um, 
verse one, and then Anthony, you go ahead and go into whatever you see on that verse, and I'll come in afterwards because I'm going to do the Hebrew and the LXX Greek. Okay, so now it came to pass on the 13th year in the fourth month on the fifth day of the month. As I was among the captives by the river Chabar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like um, Ezekiel is getting is getting basically a direct revelation. Like he's he's op- heavens, like he's seen the dimension of heaven, like like what he's seen is is beginning to open up is this dimension as what is we begin to read as we begin to read further so god's opening up and saying okay i'm gonna i'm gonna pry into you a higher dimension of reality because that is the heavens were opened and i saw visions of god god's a higher realm he's a higher dimension and so we're seeing we're exi- we're seeing him describe a higher dimension of reality. That's this is what I believe when when it says, and the heavens were opened, and he saw visions of God. I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, and to, just to touch on that fact, right? So we understand that our universe is is basically broken down into 10 dimensions. It could be 11, it could be 12, we don't know. But what we can mathematically prove is that there are 10 dimensions to our universe and we live in three and experience one. So we can interact with all three of the lower dimensions, but we can only experience time, space time. Um, So when he is, I love how Ezekiel says, and the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Now I'm going to take a look real quick. So let's look at the words that are used here. And the reason why I'm going to bring this topic up, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'll end up going into my gallery as well, because there's going to be some photos that are associated with this. But here we see that, um, and were opened, Ptah, Shemaim, Ra'ah, Mara, Elohim. Right. So that's these essentially on the left side of the page there. You see Ptah, Samaim, Ra, Mara, and Elohim. Now, this word here, Shemaim, right? If you were to, let's see if I can highlight it real quick. Go on. If you look at this word, right, take off, take off the shin. And the word that you have here is the Hebrew word for waters, mine. Okay, so what we see is you add a shin to the word mine. So take that off. See if I can, come on, highlight it. Why won't it highlight it? Okay, here we go. Why? I want it to highlight the shin. There we go. Okay. (laughs) Hebrew is backwards, and I was going forwards. Okay, so this letter here, shin, this is um, this is usually representative of God's power. Uh, Most of the time, Paleo Hebrew, it's represented as three teeth. so here we see that God's power is added to mime. So this is mime, maim, yod, maim. Um, and that's a final form maim on the left side. But you see that God's power, shin, is added to the mime or the waters. Why do you think that the Bible represents what, what as living waters? Spirit, right? So... The spirit shall flow from us as living waters. So in this word, we, we have this shin maim, shin maim yod maim. So when you add the power of God to the waters, something occurs. Well, why is water significant? Let's go to my gallery. Oh, that's a picture of me. 
Okay, biblical and scientific data. Um, where's it at? Um, I don't know why I can't find it. Um, here we go. Okay. Let's scroll down here. So our universe, this is a view of the observable universe. So the observable universe has an interconnected lattice of galaxies. And what connects these lattices of these lattices of the galaxies are things that are known as plasma filaments. Plasma filaments are essentially giant wires in space that interconnect every galaxy and every star and planetary system in our universe. And these little wires jumble together into bigger wires. So like the small wire of plasma energy that is connected to the sun in our solar system would then go out into space and join up with larger filaments to create an even more massive filament. And the more filamentary wires you get jumbled together then you get formations like galaxies so each one of those dots is a galaxy and they are all connected by this interwoven spider webs like filamentary structure of our universe okay so now let's go here these filaments are made of plasma these are the three different types of plasma. Our sun is an example. Lightning is an example. Welding is an example. Our sun is basically fire. Fire is a form of plasma. So here we go. More forms of plasma. Neon signs. They're a form of electrified plasma, solar wind, nebulas in space, plasma balls, aurora borealis, lightning, sun plasma, but flames, fire. Fires are plasma. So later on in Ezekiel, as we read earlier when we went through the, the the whole chapter, you'll see that Yeshua has essentially lightning and fire coming from him. He has flames and lightning coming from him. What does it say that the heavens are? Sha mine. Sha mine. Water, right? Would it interest you, anybody to, un, to know that all plasma in our universe and out in space is water-based? So let me see if I can find Ed Bordeaux's um, assessment. I think it's in my Genesis study. Genesis. Here we go. Yes. Where? are you i'm searching i'm searching because i'm dumb here we go okay so in 2010 edward bordeaux a professor of chemistry at the university of new orleans re-examined the original proposal that all matter in space was based on carbon so what he found was that all plasma in space along with hydrogen he found oxygen not carbon which created the molecules of all plasma in space. This is the origin of elements at the Big Bang. Is this is what they're trying to research. Ed Bordeaux is um, he's at the University of New Orleans, which is not too far away from me. Um, and he was researching the Big Bang and all of the elements that stemmed from that. So what we find, what he found when looking at analysis in space, he found that the building blocks that were in these plasma filaments in space were made of hydrogen and oxygen. Using oxygen nuclei, along with hydrogen nuclei, he proved that all elements could form by plasma fusion in just a few hours. That's at the Big Bang. But what does two hydrogen and an oxygen make? If all plasma in space is made of, it has hydrogen and oxygen, if you take two of those hydrogen atoms and one of those oxygen atoms, what have we created? We have created water. So that means that these, all galaxies, 
So this, these are plasma filamentary formed galaxies in the laboratory. That means that all galaxies in space, let me go back to the filamentary picture. Here we go. Let's go back to it. Uh, this is not it. There we go. So all of these galaxies that we see in this spectral analysis from space, that the interconnections between them, um, we see that the interconnections between all of the galaxies in space, which are plasma filaments, are hydrogen and oxygen based. If they are hydrogen and oxygen based, then that means that all plasma in space is made up of some form of highly electrified water, plasmified water. So when we see in Ezekiel that the heavens opened up, okay, so it came to pass in the 13th year on the fourth month on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chabar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. What was opened? Heavens. What is the heavens? Plasma-based water. So what he was able to see, what Ezekiel was able to see, was in space. This is obviously talking about space because the only place where there's plasma-based water. So he was literally looking up into the sky, out into space, and he saw the dimensionality peel back, space-time open up, and was be able to see a vision of what God had to say. But it's interesting that he says the direction that he's looking up. Everybody thinks, oh, well, what is what is the heavens? Well, the heavens is obviously where the shemaim, where the maim would be. The water, the maim, the water in space. So we know for a fact that he was looking up into space and basically space opened for him because he saw the Shemaim open to reveal this vision of God. So, and it's funny, they call this the heavens, the sky, the visible heavens, the sky as the abode of the stars, as the visible universe, the sky, atmosphere, etc. So the this word shemaim gives air that what he was looking at was he was looking at space open or space time open because you never say space any physicist would tell you you never say space without time being attached to it because they are woven together so as anthony was saying what he was seeing was that space was opened space time was separated and a window was created to see this vision of god that ezekiel gets so right here we already have physics information directional information and a, a basic mathematical overlay of space time being opened for ezekiel to see this vision okay so now uh go on to verse um I think verse two, on the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, I think I'm going to go ahead and just connect the next two. The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Jabbar, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Anthony, what do you got for us? Are you there? Oh, yeah, 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 I'm here now. Um, <clears throat> well, what I mean for verse two, what I, I mean, I what, what popped up at verse two, because it said right here, the king captivity, the fifth year, um, the king's ca uh, held captive. So, I mean, I, I'm that 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 was put in there, and I was just thinking maybe. Because no longer the king, it's the king's ruling. God's, God's the king, you know? So this king's captive. Like, no longer you're on the throne. It's just a reminder. Maybe Ezekiel's, you know, God's in control. 
God's on the throne and he's not captive. You, you, you know what I mean? That's what I'm getting from uh, verse two. Because verse three, I, 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 I'm seeing um, the hand of God, but I was just, I'm thinking that. Okay. Um, let me, sorry, my uh, family just got home and I was uh, saying hi to them real quick. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go back to screen and share. <laughs> Okay. You guys can hear me, right? Everybody can hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so um, verse two, on the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth, or on the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chabar. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. So this gives us an, uh, a clue as to when this happens, right? Because well, as we were talking about earlier, um, Nebuchadnezzar sacks Jerusalem and puts Jehoiachin up as a vassal king. So on the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year. So this says that it's five years after Jehoiachin was placed up as vassal king. So this Jehoiachin is the second king that was put over Jerusalem. So Ezekiel, the beginning of Ezekiel's book, takes place during the second vassal king. This is just before mm. the destruction of Jerusalem. So what we can get a clue at is we know that um, uh, Jeconiah, who was put up as king before Jehoiachin, that mm. Jeconiah reigned for a period of time and then Jehoiachin. So we're talking if Nebuchadnezzar sacks Jerusalem the first time in 605 BC when he first ascends to, as king of Babylon. So we can at least put this between 580 and 590 BC. So that's about when this book takes place. Um, and it's convenient that God puts that, that date there so that we can we can figure that out. So, and then we see that the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest. So Ezekiel was a what? He was a priest, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chabar. And the hand of the, the, hand of the Lord was upon him there. Interesting fact. Um, Anthony, I'm going to go ahead. And, you got anything you want to say about ver, uh, verse three? Because I'm going to, I got some stuff no, I'm going to go into. No, 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 no. Okay. Nothing, nothing comes to mind. Okay, so. Uh, verse 3, 1, 3 here we have, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, right? So, but the hand of the Lord was upon him. So let's look at the word for hand, okay? So the word is yod. It's a yod dalith. Up here at the top, you can see this word, yod dalith. Um, now, underneath that yod, you see a nikudot, which is a vowel point system. Um, but that's not as important. It just tells you how to pronounce the Y in case you don't know uh, in the Yod, in case you don't know what letter influences the noise of each of the Hebrew characters. Um, a Yod, so that Daleth down there that looks like a bow tie, says that, um, that, it's, that it is not a Y, but it's a Ya. So it's a Y-A sound versus a Y-U sound or, um, or just a Y sound, right? A regular Y sound would be an E, right? So this determines how that Yod sounds. So it is Yod, so it's Ya and then Dalith. Y A Dalith. Okay, so this represents the word hand. Hand, what is a hand? What does a hand do? A hand picks things up, a hand sets things down. A hand is the means by which any man does anything. We can speak. We can see, we can hear, but if you want to actually physically do something, you use your hand to do it. You grasp it, you hold it, you implement power through your hands. Think of a fighter when they fight, I punch people in the face. When I punch people in the face, the power from my muscles is transferred to my hand to punch that person in the face. So if I want to choke a person unconscious, my hands are required to go around that person's neck 
cinch up on their neck and squeeze their neck until they stop breathing and go to sleep uh, or if they tap. Um, but these are all things. Sorry, I used very, very horrible analogies for what to do with hands. Oh, my gosh. I am not. Uh, sorry, people. I, I fight for, for fun, so I can't help it. But the hand is the representation of the power of a man, and it's also a representation of the power of God. So it's the strength, power. Um, it can also, so this word yod can also mean sign, monument, part, time repetition, axle, tr axle trees, axle stay support. But the most represented use, um, it, it, the most represented use of this word yod is the hand or the hand of a man or the hand of God. Now, we know that a hand exerts power, um, that a man exerts his power through his hand. So if we are the express image of God upon the earth, then everything about us will be a representation of how things work in the heavenly realms. So God does things by his hand i.e. man does things by their hands. So if we want to exert power, if we want to grasp something, if we want to pick something up, if we want to read a book, we are required to use our hands to open these things. So the truest form of exerting a man's power comes through his hands. Now, that means that the truest form, if we are the express image of God on the earth, then that means that the truest form of what God does, he does through his hand. Well, what would be considered God's hand? If you look at, okay, now we're going to go back to my gallery for a second. Let's look at atomic structure, okay? So I go back to my Genesis study. We're going to go down here. I know I've got a picture of atomic molecules where are they boom okay this isn't a molecule this isn't an atom but this is a representation of an atom now i wonder if i can draw on this that would be cool hold on Let's see if i can do it if i can do this if i can draw on this i'll be such a happy camper okay so no 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 how do i how do i do it i'm gonna figure it out don't judge me. I'm trying. I'm trying my best here. There we go. Ha ha. This distance right here between the nucleus of an atom and the lowermost orbiting electron cloud. Wow, that is a horrible arrow, Mike. You just should not quit your day job. Don't stop. Um, okay, there we go. Yep, I'm not an artist, y'all. Okay, so. Hold on one sec. Someone's leaving the driveway. Okay, so. This distance here. Between the outer or the innermost electron and the outermost um, proton or neutron. Doesn't seem like a big distance here. Right? So it doesn't seem like it's that far. Really doesn't seem like it's that far. But if you were to take a basketball and it was to represent the nucleus of an atom and you were to take a P to represent the electron and that was our size representation, you would have to take the P that represents that electron or a marble or whatever you should choose and you would have to take it seven miles away. In order to accurately represent the distance between the basketball, which is the nucleus, and the electron, which is the marble, seven miles away is how far you would have to take that. So what we have in the center of this atomic structure all through here is empty space. There's nothing there. It's just empty space. So when you look at an atom, it's really nothing. 
if you look at a board, if you were to look at, let's say if you got a table sitting in front of you, right? The table sitting in front of you. There is more empty space in that table than there is mass. Yes, an atom creates mass, but it creates mass how? Electromagnetically. The electrons that are orbiting around the outside, these little guys right here, these, these, those electrons, those are what prevents nucleus from atoms from colliding together. So the energy that is produced by those electrons is actually what causes touch, the feeling of so solidity. Like a piece of wood or a table in front of you is solid. It's really the electrons in the molecules and atoms in your hand that are preventing your hand from going straight through whatever you touch. Because in reality, there is much less thing in an atom than there is actual mass and, uh, uh, and particles. So for all intents and purposes, the only thing that is preventing you from punching your own hand through your own leg is electromagnetism. So now let's boil it down. Let's go ahead and boil this down, right? How does this relate? Think about it for a second, okay? If electromagnetism in every atom in your body is what is preventing atoms from colliding and causing the sensation of touch and your ability to pick something up in your hand and your ability to exert force by punching someone in the face is not truly anything other than electromagnetism. Little packets of electromagnetism, these little electrons that are orbiting around the nucleus of this um, atom, are preventing other nucleus from other atoms and other electrons from colliding into it. So in actuality, your hand really is not what is exerting your force. It is electromagnetism. So that means if electromagnetism, without electromagnetism, you would not have a hand. Without electromagnetism, you would not be able to pick anything up. You would not be able to set anything down. You wouldn't be able to hold anything. You wouldn't be able to dial on your phone, play on your smartphone. You wouldn't be able to open doors. You wouldn't be able to do anything. Without electromagnetism, nothing is possible. Now, remember, we are the express image of how God does all things. And if everything in this universe is electromagnetically driven, then that means that the hand of God could be represented as electromagnetism. And what is electromagnetism? Well, the plasma that we just talked about that is in space is all 100% electromagnetic. The atoms in your body are all electromagnetically driven. Every occurrence in our entire universe is electromagnetically driven. Now, what does an electromagnetic packet look like? Let's take a look at some polyglots. I know you guys are so interested to go into polyglots and polycons. And let's take a look at some polyglots. So this is a representation of the fabric of space-time. Remember, Ezekiel says that space-time was opened. So that means that these little packets that expand and contract to make up all of existence in our universe. This is what our dimension is made out of. These are, therefore, little packets of electromagnetism woven together, as you see on this image. This is not the space-time woven together, but this is a representation of how polymers align themselves, and it's a very accurate representation of how polyglots align themselves. Take a look at a Mandelbrot set. Here, here's some different images of polyhedra, which is another term for polyglots. This is an, another representation of a polyglot. This is an electromagnetic rendition of a polyglot. These are packets of electromagnetism that would essentially be artist rendered like this. All of those things coming off of it are arms that allow it to connect to other polyhedra. 
to create the fabric of space-time. And the fabric of space-time, believe it or not, is woven into the fabric of dimensionality is in every single one of your atoms. Everything in each of those atoms is made up of these little electromagnetic packets known as polyhedra or polyglots. So when Ezekiel says that the hand of the Lord was upon him, what could he be saying? If we just use the understanding that we just developed, what could the hand of God be? Well, if everything in our universe is dependent on electromagnetic impulses and God is in everything in our universe, he is the fabric that our universe is made up of, then very well, it could be saying that the power, when it says the hand, because hand usually represents power, the power of the electromagnetism that makes up the entirety of our universe was upon Ezekiel in this moment. And we saw earlier in verse one, where it talks about the heavens, space-time being opened. So now we're talking about dimensionality. And here we are in verse three, again, talking about dimensionality. I would say that that's a pretty good analysis of what Ezekiel is really going to be getting into in this book. These first two, these first three verses, supremely underlie, underline that fact that the entirety of what he's going to be getting into is interdimensional. Because we're already talking about the fabric that our dimension is made up of. Okay, so moving on, now that uh, we've gone over that, so now let's get to verse four. Wow, it's taken us an hour to get three verses in. I am terrible. Okay. Sorry, you can hear my baby. It's making noise in the back, right? Sorry, I had to, my baby is so cute. I had to I had to tickle her. I just, I just had to do it. I just had to. Okay, so um so let's go on to verse number four. So then I looked and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself and brightness was all around it and radiating out of its midst, like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Anthony, I'm sure you have a lot to say about this verse. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you go first. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, so, okay. So um, think about, think, think about, it says the whirlwind. Okay, so think about um, Elijah. Think of of um, taken up into the whirlwind as well. Okay, and so what I what I want you guys to get an idea is um, the ancients are describing a whirlwind because that's what they've they've known. Okay, but this whirlwind. Think of it like uh, going left to right. Almost like a, that's all they, it's so a portal opening up, like a world went sideways, think of it. And, and all of a sudden it opens up. So I, I believe he's, he's describing, when they describe the world win, I believe it's, it's every time God, because God's described in a world win, it's not the world win that we're used to, you know, where we see a world win swirling on the ground and, but the ancients knew that as a whirlwind, but they called that because they saw that dimension. And I believe Ezekiel saw the same thing that was take, took Elijah up, which was the same whirlwind. But it's not a whirlwind that goes from the ground up. It's a whirlwind that opens up the sky like a whirlwind. And so I believe that is what he saw, which and we begin to see this. What is it? It says the the fire, the, the thunders and stuff. And this is the, the, the dimension opening up because when we think about let's, we got to think in the, in terms of the Bible as a higher dimension, because when it says that, and they built a tower up, it's not necessarily Elijah went up like the built up it's, they built up into heaven. 
They pried into heaven. You understand what I'm saying? So the, the technology was very advanced, but they didn't know how to be able to describe it. So I, I just wanted to point out that I believe that, and, and, and I think Mike would, would say the same thing, that this was a portal opening up. And this is the best description that he could say is a whirlwind. So, yeah. I totally agree. Um, I think the analysis of, so let's, let's take a look at it, right? So we're going to think of this here in a very primitive sense. Just as Anthony was talking, we're dealing with a group of people who typically describe things as things that they understood. They understood tornadoes and whirlwinds and like whirlpools in the water because these were naturally occurring things. But I really don't think it was what we would see as a whirlwind. I really do think that it was. Um, okay, we got you got to think for a second. You open space time. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> Let's cut a hole in space time. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think it's just going to be like you cut a sheet and it's just a couple of flaps of a sheet that are flapping on either side of it? Or do you think that the amount of energy required to cut space-time, to open space-time, would have some sort of physics interaction that would be associated with it? Think about CERN, right? The Large Hadron Collider. They've been trying to tear a hole in space-time, and they have to use 13.6 tera-electron volts to do it. That is 50,000 times stronger than the than the 200 million gauss that comes from our earth this is 50,000 times stronger than the electromagnetic field of the earth that's the amount of power that they have to produce in order to send these particle the proton and electron beam to collide to in order to try to rip space-time open so yes if you cut open space-time something's going to happen. So a great whirlwind. Now it says a cloud with raging fire engulfing itself. So it's swirling. It's engulfing itself, right? You got to think of um, when you stir something for anybody that does any baking. Um, I'm probably not the best baker, but when you mix a batter, you dip the spoon down into it and then pull the bottom up to the top. So you're essentially engulfing itself as you stir inside the bowl to mix this cake batter or whatever. Um, so basically, it's rolling in on itself, which gives heed to the word that they used, whirlwind, right? A whirlwind literally looks like it's engulfing itself. Now, it had raging fire. What did we establish in verse one that fire is? It's plasma. What did we establish that all things in space time are made out of plasma? We also established that plasma is electromagnet, uh, electromagnetic. Let me go ahead and go deeper into this electromagnetism. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and do the elements in space, and I'm going to show you a representation of that if I can find it. Okay, so this is a representation of a plasma filament. This is one that was done in the lab. It's like a giant wire of electromagnetic energy. Let me see if I can find the one. There. So this would be a representation of the electromagnetic and electrical currents that are associated with electrical wires in your home which is what a plasma filament in space is. It's just like an electrical wire. This is a plasma filament. This is a uh, rendition of what a plasma filament in space would look like. Like a giant wire. Each one of those arms and strings that you see are smaller wires that make up the plasma filament. Now, is it in here? No, it'll be in my Genesis study, probably. Let's go to Genesis. Is it here? Is it here? Oh, obviously it's not. 
Oh, that makes me sad. I don't, it might be. It might be in my sick coat study. Sorry, bear with me. I'm I'm a retard. Um, speech for sicko. Where are you at? Why? There we go. Oh, that's sad. It's not here either. Okay. I'm retarded. Okay, so I'll just go back here. Okay, so plasma filaments in space, as you saw in that image before, here it is, that image, um, they're like wires in space. And the more of these plasma filaments you get grouped together, the bigger the wire becomes until you have galaxy-sized wires jumbled in space. Now, these are not visible to the naked eye. Obviously, you would need some sort of spectral telescope to be able to analyze the light that is emitted from um the light that is emitted from these plasma filaments. Um, examples of plasma pinches on filaments is um, this image. This is both the ant and the butterfly nebula, nebula. So the ant nebula on the left, the butterfly nebula on the right. Plasma filament would be running. Yeah, let me see if I can do this. Pick, boom. I'm right on it. And then is it that one? No. That one, that one. There we go. Okay, so the plasma filament would essentially be running up through it like this. So plasma filament running through each one of these nebula like that. And that spot here where you see the pinch has occurred, I like being able to do this with my... That's cool. Okay, so um, that pinch area that you see right here that is where the electromagnetic field, one wire gets jumbled upon another because this is an amassment of many, many different wires going through here. They'll pinch together in this location and jumble together. And what they will do is they will arc like a welder's arc will do when they weld pieces of metal together. Okay, so um, now these plasma filaments in space um these plasma filaments in space are electromagnet uh, electromagnetically charged so there is a current that is running through them so now let's go back to here okay so there is essentially a current running through the electromagnetic uh plasma filaments that are going through each one of the um, each one of the uh, galaxies and stars where Bennett pinches occur. Now, this is a representation of the electromagnetic field of uh, of currents um, traveling through wires, which is the same exact principle that is used in space because plasma filaments are just giant wires in space. But they are 100% electromagnetically driven. So they create electromagnetic currents. It's actually... So electromagnetism is 10 to the 24th. Let me write, let me type that out for you. Uh, let's see if I could go to notes. No. Let's see if I could do it right here in Bible. So 10 to the 24th. That number that you see represented there at the very top. Electromagnetic forces are 10 to the 24th times stronger than gravitational forces in space. So stars and stuff did not, the planets that are surrounding stars do not surround stars because of gravity. They do it because of electromagnetism. They're orbiting like electrons around its nucleus. So there's a reason why the orbit of our solar system looks similar to um the orbit of electrons around an atom. Everything in the macro scale and everything on the micro scale matches. Okay, so now what we see is that as we established in the last verse and as we were established in the first verse, um, what we're seeing is that a cut in space-time is occurring 
and then coming out of it is fire. Fire is a form of plasma. It's a form of electromagnetism. And it was brightness all around. And radiating out of its midst like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. So what we're seeing here is fire, a very bright uh, something, light, photons. Well, photons are electromagnetic packets of light. So again, we see more electromagnetism. So we see that there's a tear in space-time. This tear in space-time that God puts there is a window, which is in the Shemaim, right? The water-based heavens that he's looking at. So he's seeing sp space rip open and a window viewing into a higher dimension. And from this ripping creates this whirlwind with this great raging fire that's spinning upon itself, engulfing itself, causing immense amounts of electromagnetic light to radiate out from it in the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Well, let's look at amber on a spectral scale. So I know I have my spectral analysis graph here somewhere. Oh, I really need to organize this better. I've done so many studies stuff. Become very disorganized. Where is it? Here we go. Okay. So this is a spectral analysis of galaxies far away. But what we can see is this. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and use my pen here. It's a really good tool. I'm going to. I really like it. Oh, how do I? There we go. Go there. There. Okay. So in this photo, oh, on this end of the scale here, down here. Come on. Why won't it? At this end of the scale, that's the amber end, right? So right about here would be amber. On this end of the scale down here is higher energy output. And at this end of the scale down here, it's lower energy output. So what we see is that the blue end of the scale is a more energetic light and the red end of the scale is a less energetic light now we know that light we now know that light is not doppler affected we so what i mean there is that we used to think that light like the doppler effect where a sound wave gets trapped behind another sound wave causing an ambulance coming towards you to sound higher pitched and going away it sounds lower pitched because the sound waves jumble together from it as it's coming towards you and then they elongate as it goes past you. Well, what we now know is light does not do that. So we don't have a red shift down here of light because of the Doppler effect. We have that red shift due to the energy outputs of the electromagnetic light. So what we're seeing is that God is talking about, or Ezekiel is seeing what God is doing, and it's in this amber scale right here. So that means that the amount, the um, energies that Ezekiel was allowed to see in this moment was at the lower end of the spectral scale. It was at this end. Now, remember, Moses, right? He was allowed to see God, but he was allowed to see what? The hind parts? No, he was allowed to see the lower end of the spectral scale of the light that God produces. Okay, so that's our spectral analysis. So what he sees is this amber light coming out of the midst of the fire. And it was and it was this it was in the color of amber and it was radiating out as light does. Okay. Now, going on to verse five. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. 
each had four. So I'm going to go ahead and just take these three as a packet, verse five, six, and seven. So also within it came the likeness of the four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces, and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hand. Okay, so uh, Anthony, what do you got to say about five, six, and seven? What I what I'm um, what I believe is uh, this is breaking in to the dimensions. This is showing now the actual dimensions. These are going to be the four realms, which. Um, I know, I know they say that there's 10, but, uh, um, in recently I, I, well, um, I, I discovered somebody, uh, uh, explaining and, um, I had these two images. One is, uh, um, of the star of David has, has inner and outer points are 12. And so is the cross has four dimension, 12 dimensions to it. And so what I believe is that, um, we're getting into, these four faces, these four um, angelic-like beings, uh, angels, uh, angle, angular measurements. We're getting in. Um, you know, they're they are uh, um, they are those that um, are given. Um, you know, he's given a rod, and they measure the temple. Um, these are things that they um, are given. Uh, you know, reins on. So I believe. This is uh, describing um, dimensions. You know, we we um, we have the human, which I believe um, we're on this third. You know, we're in the third this 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 dimension, um, but I believe we're a higher dimensional being. So that's I believe that's a representation of of us being uh, four, fifth, six dimensional beings, and and um, and. And so forth and so on. So as we get on to the other ones, um, I'll, I'll explain um, the other parts to those as to why I believe um, the rest of them. And it, it kind of will tie in. But yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So now verse five, verse six and verse seven. It talks about from it within it, the likeness of the four living creatures. And this was their appearance that they had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces and each one had four wings. So let me show you guys something. Uh, images. Okay. So this is the ancient Hebrew Masroth. This is the 12 constellations. Um, there are four main constellations and then they're like, like cardinal points on a, um, like cardinal points on a compass. Now, what you notice is that, let's see if I can do, can I do annotations? Oh, that'd be cool. If I could, yeah, I'm going to do it. Okay. Notice that there's a wheel inside of a wheel. There is a wheel inside of a wheel. Oh, wow, that is a very terrible color to do this in. What the heck? Give me black or make it thicker or something. Red. Why won't it pick a color? Okay, here we go. So you have a wheel inside of a wheel. Okay. Um, Undo, undo, undo. Undo. There we go. Okay. So let's stop annotation. There we go. Okay. So each one had four faces and each one had four wings. Let's take a look. Okay. There are there are basically, so this is an old Masroth circle. So you have, for those that know about, I, I don't like to use the Zodiac. 
um, because it's the Hebrew Maseroth. It's the story of the, it's the story of Messiah in the stars, but it is essentially a compass in the sky. It points to certain times. Um, so alignments of stars and things like that point to specific events. The book of Daniel is all about that. He points to Messiah. 183,880 days from the time that the prophecy was given to the Mashiach Nagid riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. That was prophesied. Exactly to the day of when that was prophesied by Daniel is when it occurred. So there was a sign that was put in the heavens by God called the Star of Bethlehem, that these Magi, these ancient Magoya, now Magi is a, a term that is representative of the astrologers, soothsayers, and th these different sects of people that were in the temp or in Nebuchadnezzar's court. So when Nebuchadnezzar becomes king, he wants to test the astrologers and soothsayers that he inherits from his father. And so he says, hey, I had a dream. And they're like, okay, cool. Tell us your dream and we'll tell you the interpretation. He goes, no, 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 no. If you're so smart, you will tell me what my dream is and tell me the interpretation. Well, obviously, these are these this group of people, they don't know that. They can't do that because God was not on their side at this time. And so Nebuchadnezzar was like, all right, well, you're all going to die and starts murking them. And for about a week period, the guards of Nebuchadnezzar goes through the lands of Babylon, every part of the kingdom, and starts killing all of these uh, astrologers and soothsayers. And then Daniel's brought up and says, hey, look, I know what your dream is. I'll tell you the dream. God has shown me what your dream is. All glory to Yeshua. And he, he probably said all glory to yod heh vav -Heh. Um, Could have said Yeshua. Who knows? Uh, but all glory be to the Most High. And this is what your dream is, and this is the interpretation. And then you have the prophecy of the um, iron mixed with clay of the feet of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, um, so Daniel is made second ruler in the kingdom and is put over these groups of people known as the Magoya and the Agoya. There's two different sects of people. The Magoya was the astrologers, soothsayers, and magicians, which is essentially the astronomers, those that cast lots, and those that dealt with like sciences and maths and things like that. And then the Agoya, which is also another sect in the Babylonian kingdom, the Agoya were the senates, the congress, and the lords of all of the land places. So these two different sects of people were known as um, the governmental system of Babylon. So the Magoya, which is what we get our term Magi from, was actually this group of people that studied the stars before Daniel became. So they studied the stars and they worshipped the stars before Daniel was made leader over them. Then we see that this group of people sends envoys at the birth of Yeshua under the prophecy that's given by Daniel, and they bring frankincense, gold, and myrrh. So interesting that we see a group of people that were worshiping the stars and getting killed by Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC, and then in 2 BC, we see them showing up and giving gifts. Um, we see them showing up and giving gifts to the birth of the Messiah. So there's a change that occurs with the Magi. Something changes, i.e. Daniel is made leader over them. And so what they do is they use their knowledge of astronomy and the ancient Masroth, which they, they called the Zodiac, um, or their term for the Zodiac, the Akkadian term for Zodiac, which I can't pronounce because that's what the that's what Acadian sounds like, by the way. It's just like a bunch of grunts and, and loogie hawks. That's what it sounds like. 
I'm not lying. Uh, but in Akkadian, the equivalent is the word zodiac, which means the way. And the Masroth is the way that Messiah, the way of Messiah, the story of Messiah from the time of Adam and Eve all the way to the destruction of Satan at the end and everything in between. So these astrologers, soothsayers, and all these, they go from worshiping the stars to worshiping the God of heaven and bringing gifts to Messiah at his birth. So they're method of reading the stars was important enough because there was a significant event prophesied by daniel told to them that at this date the messiah is going to come because remember daniel spoke to gabriel and got the prophecy of the messiah um but they looked at the stars and they were able to tell when this specific date was based on the position of the stars and they used this known as the Masroth wheel to find that point in time now because they were able to find where the stars congregated in the sky which direction that they were and where it would set over Bethlehem where he was to be born so the stars now let's go to we're going to just take a, a sidetrack here we're going to go to Genesis Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser night to rule the night, and he made the stars also. So what is the purpose of the stars? Okay. Signs. Here we go. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for days and for years. So it says right here, Genesis 1, 14, 1, 1, 4, then God said, let there be lights. And let's really look at it in the Hebrew so if we can tell what this is actually saying. Amar Elohim, Yaha Me'or, Rakaya, Shemaim, Betal, Bain, Yom, Bain, Lail, Haya, Ot, Miod, Yom, Suna. Okay, so, and God said, so, and said God. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day, the house of the day. So this is Bain. From the house of the night. And let them be for signs. Ut, a sign, a signal, a distinguishing mark, a banner of remembrance. So what are these supposed to be? A sign of something you are supposed to remember. Miraculous sign, i.e. the Bethlehem star that set over Yeshua. Bad events that could occur in prophecy. Warnings for things to come. Token, ensign, standard, miracle, or proof of something that is occurring. So what are the stars supposed to be? They're supposed to be our clock. They are supposed to be how we can tell when seasons and things in our spiritual walk will be occurring. So when Daniel gives that prophecy of Messiah, the Magi listen to that. And they're there when Messiah is in the manger. And they come and give him gifts. A lot of scholars believe that this happened around December 21st. Yeshua was born September 23rd, but he was found when he was not right after his birth because he was already swaddled. He was um, he had already he had already been born for a significant period of time, and the Bible says that he was born after the time when. It was not in the springtime when the sheep were flocked on the hilltops, okay? So Yeshua was born in September, but they found him. The Magi found Yeshua on December 21st. One way we know is because there's only one time of year where the star of Bethlehem is typically visible. 
And in most instances in our modern time, the only time that the star of Bethlehem is visible is in December. And in recent years, the only times that we've seen it always starts on December 21st. So that's a sign that at that time, December 21st, was also a time when that specific star of Bethlehem would be in that specific part of the sky. So, star of Bethlehem being seen in December, the Magoya finding, or the Magi finding Yeshua on December 21st, um, these are all significant dates. And the only way we're able to know these dates is if we know about this wheel within a wheel that you'll see soon and you'll see it start to describe the face of the man then the face of a what a bull then the face of a lion so you'll see that the specific things that are mentioned on the masroth are going to be mentioned by these specific creatures that are shown okay so go back to ezekiel Okay, so now uh, verse eight, nine, and ten. I'm going to go. I'm going to go ahead and just take them in threes because that'll get us through a lot faster because we're going extremely slow. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings, and their wings touched one another. The creatures creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. Interesting how the Earth rotates under the stars, and not the stars rotate over the Earth. So the stars don't move. They don't rotate. The earth is what rotates, and the earth is what's moving through the stars and through space. So when it says that, they're, that they went straight, right, their wings touched to one, and the creatures did not turn what they, when they went, but they each one went straight. So in order for these wheels to point to things or do things, Something would have to rotate under them to point them in the direction because they themselves did not turn. And as for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man, each four had the face of a lion on the right side, and each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and each of the four had the face of an eagle. What do we see? Man, lion, ox, eagle. What are the four cardinal points on the Masroth? It, it is a man a lion, a bull, and an eagle. That's literally the four cardinal points on the Masroth. They're, they're compass points. Anthony, what do you got to say about uh, 8, 9, and 10? Yeah, yeah, I, um, I, I believe that because I believe um, what I believe is that um, this heaven's earth is a replica of, of, of God's dwelling. Because you have mountains, you have a river where God dwells. So it, it's a place similar to where we exist. So what I believe that as, as we begin to see the lion, the man, the ox, and the eagle, I've been doing um, some studies with the animals. And um, they, the ox right here only goes one direction. And that's for the first. That's for the first dimension, and then we have the eagle that can fly going up. He can go forward. He can go left. He can go right. And then we got our our three dimensions mentioning of the eagle, and all these are fused together when you read it in the Hebrew. So I believe it's it's reflecting all these dimensions that are encompassed within these four. Uh, descriptions and then broken up into four descriptions of oxes and eagles and then you have the man which i believe is the higher dimension which then what we're at in this particular time but because we foul from what adam and eve and when you read they were clothed with some electrical packets of light of some sort because they were clothed with something interestingly enough so so here now we have the man so i believe there was a higher dimension to the man and then and then we have ultimately the the lion which represents one day 
we will be like him. And the lion's the king of the jungle. It's ultimately like you, if you want to be, you want to be the lion. And so Christ is representative of the lion, which is ultimately the ultimate dimension. And when you become the lion, you're conquering. And so I believe this is um, showing uh, a reference into the actual dimensions on top of it, referring to the all 12 dimensions. And I have, I have two images that um, the cross, like I said earlier, the cross has actually 12 dimensions to it. Um, the uh, star of David has 12 dimensions to it and it's tucked in and points out. Um, and you could check that out, but yeah, if you wanna go further, but yeah. Heck yeah. See, I, I, this is why I like having uh, two different people doing these dissections because it gives two very unique, different perspectives on the same scripture. Um, so this is, it's awesome because I see, I, I love seeing other people's views of scripture as I go through it as well, because it, all of it builds on the full picture that we all gain from scripture. Uh, so I love it. This is awesome. Okay, so now, um, as for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man, each had the face of a lion. Okay, so we went through that. So thus were their faces. Their wings stretched upward, two wings of each one touched one another, and two covered their bodies. And each one went straight forward, and they, and they went wherever the spirit wanted to go, and they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. Anthony, I'm going to let you go first, and then I'll, I'll go, on to the, go on to it. You there, Anthony? Oh, my bad, my bad. I was muted. Sorry, I, I, I have muted. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm keep getting these descriptions of, see, it, the reason why it's hard to understand is because imagine putting um, higher dimension of, you know, putting a, 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 a 5D image on a 2D paper, okay? So, He's describing some things to us that he's rendering and dissecting. So it's this higher dimension because God is ultimately in a higher dimension than we are. And um, we are trying to fathom who he is. And I believe it's going to take all eternity to be able to him to express all of his dimensionality to us because it's we we just can't i mean it has to be little by the time because at some point we could die if he shows us too much of himself so somehow some way he's gonna do something and and it to to, to I, I don't know but all i know is this is describing he's to the best of his ability uh, a, a movement of in higher dimension higher reality because when Christ says that we're in you, he's talking in higher dimensions. He's like, we're inside of you. He goes, if you believe in us, then me and my father make our home within you. He's talking at a higher dimension. So we just think that, oh, yeah, God is. No, God is right there tucked next to us in a higher dimension. That dimension is right beside us. So when we're reading these things, take it as in a higher understanding, higher realm of thinking not in this plain linear mentality not this flat land or flat mentality you know god is 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 higher dimensions you know I, that's what that's what i come when i'm reading that yeah um i agree i i completely agree um so their faces, their wings, um, uh, or sorry, I, my mind uh, blended those two sentences together. 
Their wings stretched upward, two wings of each one touched one another, and two covered their bodies, and each one went straight forward. They went wherever the spirit wanted to go. They did not turn when they went. Um, so the higher dimensional aspect of scripture when we look at something from our dimensional understanding right we look at it as we have up down left right back forward right so we have basically six different directions in which we can go but in a higher dimensional sense you may not even need to go in a direction to move you wouldn't need you wouldn't necessarily need to in order for you to move forward or you to turn um best best way i could describe this okay so everybody has seen like those videos of ufos right how a ufo will just travel and then just come to a stop right and, like it's separated from our gravity um and it just stops instantaneously and what we see these UFOs do, oh, wow, that's weird. I don't understand it. And a lot of people have fetishes with UFOs. But what people don't understand is most of those UFOs are demonic in origin. Um, and so by definition, the demons, the fallen angels, were able to access higher dimensional planes than, than ours. So when you see these things where they just come to a stop, they're most likely interdimensional um they most likely have access to rules of physics that we don't have access to and that's just with the fallen angels right we know that they were connected with god at one point we know that they have access to a higher plane of existence um i mean they can enter people um demons can literally enter people so they have access to another dimension than ours they have access to basically going through things, going into things, inhabiting things. Um, so then when we we're talking about this rip in space time, right? Um, I think that this, these verses in Ezekiel have dual meaning. Because what Anthony's talking about with um, this, the dimensional aspect of this, it, it, I, would, I would say that it's very accurate. And also, there's also a level of... Um, a position of the stars there may be a reason there's probably hidden here inside of ezekiel um a essentially time stamp of what the stars will look like at the point that all of this occurs right so it could be a time stamp that's why there's the masroth references here in it and it's also t we're all, we also know that it's a rip in space time and he's gaining access and looking outside of his dimensional plane. He's looking into an existence in which obviously these creatures are not turning when they move, but they're just moving in whatever direction the spirit tells them to go. If we know that God does all things through electromagnetism when he's interacting with our universe, because everything in our universe is dependent on electromagnetism, then our understanding of how these things move and how these things are, are doing things are, is very, very minute. But we know that the spirit is in these things. Use a primitive mind, right? So Ezekiel's using a primitive mind. He's looking at a, both a map of the stars for when these events occur and into a dimensional plane. Remember, he was looking up into space, right? I'm standing outside the front of my house right now. And I look up and I can see the stars. Now, if I was to take a snapshot of what those stars look like currently right now, somebody 2,000 years in the future could tell when that photo was taken by how those stars looked. And we know Ezekiel was looking up. He looked up into the Shemayim and saw a window. So when he looked up, there's a snapshot of what the stars look like. And his only representation of that is to underlay or encode Masroth references in what he's talking about and now he's seeing a window into a higher dimensional plane inside of the shemaim so we have multiple levels of aspect here we see that there's 
the snapshot of the stars that's being viewed here, where it's talking about these Masros influences, but he's also seeing actual creatures, real actual creatures doing real actual things through this window into space. So he's looking into a higher dimensional plane, as Anthony was talking about, and I think it's a very accurate representation to say that each one of these four creatures could be a representation of the four aspects of dimensionality that we experience and above space-time. So now they each went straight forward. They went wherever the spirit wanted to go, and they did not turn when they went. Again, our understanding of that is very limited because we are also cursed with primitive minds. We have to think in things that obey the laws of physics that we understand. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. Again, we see this reference to plasma. We see electromagnetic occurrences happening in this plane of existence where he's seeing these creatures. Their appearance was burning coals. Their appearance was also of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. So what we're seeing is plasma jets jetting between these two entities and the fire was bright fire is a form of plasma so what we're seeing is all of the physics so let's let's take a let's take a think take a think for a second let's take a think for a second uh, it's, it's terrible english let's the texans are influencing me <laughs> i've lived here too long let's take a think okay so Let's think about this for just a second. So this is an image of, we're going to talk about the transference of energy and what could happen, what we believe would happen on an immense transference of energy event in which essentially space time was ripped open. What could we hypothesize would occur at that moment and we can take impacts on the moon and think about the transference of energy from an object striking the moon and what occurrences happen when all of these energies heat instantaneously on impact and travel through an object and create ripples all, all the way through the moon so lunar impact here on the left side and on the right side of this, on the right side of this image is this weird terrain that shows up on the moon. So now when this impact happened, it transferred an immense amount of energy. And then what was known, what's known as an ejecta cloud is ejected out from where that meteor strikes the moon. Now, this ejecta cloud on impact is superheated to where it glows. There's immense electromagnetic heat that is radiated from it it creates a shock wave that then also creates electromagnetic waves so what we get just from the impact of one object to another electromagnetic impulses so if we were to have a meteor strike the planet most likely it would wipe out communications on most of the planet if a large enough meteor ferromagnetic meteor were to strike the earth it would emit an electromagnetic pulse because of the ionization of the material upon impact when it superheats. And this ionization causes this electromagnetic impulse, which would fry most communications on the planet. Um, cell phones, things like that, they wouldn't work. Batteries wouldn't hold a charge anymore. It would take a period of time for the EMP to dissipate. Now, um, now this impact creates an electromagnetic impulse and this is just from two cosmic bodies striking each other a lot of energy that is transferred in this but now let's think for a second if we have all of these occurrence where we have an electromagnetic impulse we have extreme heat plasma created at the point of impact where it superheats mass amounts of discharge of heat energy and kinetic energy all at once just from two small objects colliding in space now imagine that the space itself that holds all of these things is ripped open what do you think 
because obviously not an impact. You can't impact space because it is what everything is in. It doesn't, you can't impact space. So it would take a different type of, but very immense energy to rip that fabric open. So very similar events would occur. Now in our, oh, dang it. In our solar system, we have something that's known as a plasma arc. When planets come close to each other, when Mars was in a resonant orbit with Earth, um, it came close to Earth and it would have what's known as a plasma discharge from planet to planet. Um, they say that the Tengunska event, the uh, crater that's in Russia that happened in the 1940s, that that was an interplanetary plasma discharge similar to this, and that's what caused it. That's why there's no impact crater from a, an event. Now, when these discharged, the Tengunska event, um, let's go to it, bing, right here. This is the Tengunska event. When it imp there was no impact crater. All it did was just lay down, all it did was basically just lay down all the trees. And just, oh, so this is in 1908. A Russian newspaper reported the following from an eyewitness, quote, on the morning of the 17th of June, around nine o'clock, we observed an unusual um, event, some strangely bright, impossible to look at, bluish white heavenly body, which came down towards Earth for 10, mi 10 minutes. So this discharge came down and they could see it for 10 minutes. So it was, it was essentially an electromagnetic discharge similar to the image that we saw here. This is the Tengunska event in the early 1900s. Now, this is just from an electromagnetic difference in these two planets. A positive and negative charge creates this arc of lightning. Notice that the color is very amber-ish. Um, this is an artist rendition, but it's very interesting that they would choose this color of arc. Now, before it would leave, before it came into our atmosphere, it would most likely be bluish in color. Bluish white heavenly body. Once it comes into our atmosphere, then, it, then our oxygen and everything on our planet would have an effect on it. But this electrical discharge, again, was extremely destructive, just as a meteor strike is. And it's just a differential of energy one charge and another charge opposing it coming close together. So how much more energy do you think would be in a tearing open of space-time? What sort of occurrences do you think would, would happen there? And the likeness of the living creatures, the appearance of torches going back and forth. Torches going back and forth. Torches going back and forth. Okay, so we're seeing electromagnetic impulses in, within this tear in space-time. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went what? Lightning. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. Now, as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. And the appearance of the wheels and their workings was like the color of barrel, and all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was, as it were, a wheel in the midst of a wheel. Okay? So, where is it? A wheel in the midst of a wheel. There are references here to the Masroth. What I believe is coded here in Ezekiel 1 in these verses. I would bet that hidden in the Gematra is a mathematical formula that I found it before in other places of the Bible. I study Gematra. Um, and for those of you that don't know, uh, this is what Gematra is. This is what Gematra is. Each of the Hebrew characters is giving it given a number value, and then you add up the value. 
And when you do that with Genesis 1, 1, you get 3.1415, which is pi. When you do it to um, John 1, 1, you get 2.7178, which is E, a natural constant logarithm. So there is value to the gamatra. And when you add up the gamatra, you can actually get spatial coordinates. And you can get a mathematical algorithm that will tell you what the stars will look like based on the mathematic gematra of these verses. And I would bet then here in Ezekiel 1, I've never done it here, uh, but I'd be interested to see if I can find this mathematical algorithm to maybe tell us what the stars will look like at the time that this event occurs, because we know that what he's getting is a tear in space time, meaning he's looking outside of time at an event that happens. And remember, all of Ezekiel, including Ezekiel 37 and 38, are for our generation. So I bet that there is a timestamp of when these events are going to occur hidden inside here in Ezekiel. And I'll take the time and do that sometime. But when they moved, they went toward any one of the four directions. They did not turn aside as they went. Anthony, what you got to say about what we've read so far? Hello? Oh, yeah, yeah. I do believe it's referring to the to the Mazara. Um, um, I do believe um, it's, you know, but, but like I said, it's, uh, I'm still working on the dimension out aspect of all of that, but I'm working on that. So, <laughs> but no, I, I do believe I, I, I do. I'm, I'm alongside with you with that about it um, referring to the Maseroth as well and pointing to because the stars are a signal. It is like a like a, a beacon um, signaling something. So I do believe that that is a a signaling of what is to come so i yeah I, I do believe yeah okay yeah i um i i think that somewhere hidden in here there will be i mean how many the prophecy of messiah was very accurate um i mean very very accurate accurate enough where the magi were able to find him at the right time so there's there's probably stuff hidden in here that i'll try to uncover in in future days and i bet you i'll be able to um it's not it's not too much um so now uh, verse 18 as for their rims they were so high they were awesome and their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them and when the living creatures went the wheels went beside them and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went because there the spirit went and the wheels were lifted together with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And I just go back to, um, I think that this is all a reference of a time stamp. Uh, I, do, I do believe that... Uh, this is 100% a view outside of our dimension and a representation of dimensionality as God so sees it. Hear, I mean, you're not, you can't hear me, right? Mm -hmm. Hello? Oh, okay, I heard somebody say something. Okay, so I do believe that, um, that this is a view outside of dimensionality. Um, and I also, so there are other scholars, just to give everybody the view of point, uh, point of view, there are other scholars that believe that these verses right here are talking about something known as an omnidirectional wheel. Uh, let's take a look at that real quick. Okay, so. Uh, there are some scholars out there who have linked this to these type of wheels, omnidirectional wheels. Uh, these are wheels within a wheel, so you can basically spin and go in any direction, side, forward, backward, um, and it allows you to move in basically in place like a tank. Uh, 
because of the the additional aspect of these wheels these are known as omnidirectional wheels so there are some scholars that believe that this is what's being talked about here when it talks about a wheel within a wheel and don't get me wrong i i definitely see where they're coming from on that um i and i could i i really could see that it would be talking about an omnidirectional wheel and the reason why is because there is a new vert oh let me see if i can find it uh, um new hover tank okay so we have let's see if i can find it russia has invented a specific type of tank and it looks very similar to um is, let's see if let's see if they have it in images so russia has a, essentially created a tank a new type of weapon that um doesn't have to turn in, in in order to move and there are some scholars I, I won't name them but there are some scholars that has likened this to uh this hover tank um and so i'm just trying to give you guys all the different points of views that uh i've seen other scholars have on this i don't necessarily agree with all of them but it's good that we have all of the point of views um my job is not to tell you which way to think. My job is just to give you the information to think about. So when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went because there the spirit went and the wheels were lifted together with them for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When these stood, these stood. Or when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth the wheels were lifted up together with them for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels okay let's take a look at this real quick if it'll load hmm. there we go okay so ruahe apan the spirit of the living creatures Okay, was in the wheels from an unused route, meaning to revolve. Chariot wheel, wheel in Ezekiel's vision. Okay, so it's literally saying that the spirit, the wind, breath, mind, or spirit. So this is. The whole time that it's been referencing the spirit here, it's been talking about the spirit of God, wherever the spirit wanted to go, because there the spirit went for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Yeah, the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. So we're talking about the spirit of God is in these wheels that are associated with these living creatures. Now, my Masroth explanation of this could not explain the spirit being in those wheels. Um, obviously, we're talking about an actual, true, real object, an actual, true, real creature. There's a saying that Chuck Misler has is that the more literal you take the Bible, the better your understanding will be. And Chuck says that in almost every time where he's looked at the Bible, the more literally he's taken it, the better off he's been. And then it turns out to be accurate because it literally gets fulfilled. Um, so when it's talking about these wheels, yes, it could be talking about the Masroth, which um, I, I think that there's Masroth, Masroth references here. But at the same time, these are going to be actual physical creatures. These will be actual physical wheels. This will be an actual physical event. It's literal. It will literally mean what it is literally saying. So as much as I like my Masroth explanation of this, my Masroth explanation is... Um, one aspect of it, but there's also going to be a literal fulfillment of this in actual literal events. So 
there is an actual spirit of these living creatures that will be in these actual wheels at the time when this happens. He's seeing a vision into the future through this pair in space time. He's seeing into eternity, and eternity is showing him these images that are associated with it. So the likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. <clears throat> and under the firmament, their wings spread out straight, one towards another. Each one had two, which covered one side, and each one had two, which covered the other side. Again, what we're seeing is Masroth references to what's being seen here. But again, also, there's a literal aspect of it. There's a literal something that was above their heads that was awesome and crystal in color now it uses the term firmament which modern israeli physicists use the word rakaya to mean atmosphere so many people use the archaic understanding that this is a solid glass surface because they want to think primitively like was being thought in the old testament times we, however, have the value of physics on our side. Sorry, flat earthers, you guys don't. Um, but yes, a solid extended surface. Solid just meaning not that it's solid like if you hit it, you won't be able to go through it, but solid in a sense where it was all one object. Just like the electromagnetic field around the Earth is one solid electromagnetic field around the Earth, but it is not something that you can't pass your hand through, right? So just like the air around us is solid oxygen and molecules, yet it doesn't stop me when I walk through it. So again, archaic understanding of what solid meant in this sense. So. And under the firmament, their wings spread out straight one towards another. Remember, it's these four wings, right? And each one had two, which covered one side, and each one had two, which covered the other side of the body. There's that four wings. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult like the noise of an army. And when they, st stood, and when they stood still, they let down their wings. Okay, so the noise of their wings, like many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, and like the tumult noise of an army. Four wings making three different sounds. What is four times three? Twelve. So what we're seeing here is twelve aspects of what is occurring. So each of these four wings made a noise like both many water or like all many waters the voice of God, and the noise of an army. So each one of these wings is portraying three different audible aspects to it. Okay, this is literal. Remember, this is going to actually be literal as well, as well as metaphorical. There are allegoric things in here, but it's not all allegoric. And a voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. Whenever they stood, they let down their wings. So they're making a noise like the voice of the Almighty, but then also the voice of the Almighty is coming down. So now we have a fourth noise that is occurring. And above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was the likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Who is that man sitting on the throne? Who is that man sitting on the throne? Yeshua. And also from the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw, as it were, the color of amber. Okay, so he is getting a literal view into the dimensionality where the throne of God sits. And remember, what does it say in Revelation? Let's go. Let's go to Revelation. We're going to go to Revelation for a second. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angels to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Okay, so John gets the vision of the seven churches, which are in Asia. Grace be to you, peace from him who is 
who is and who was and who is to come from the seven spirits which are before his what? Throne. Who is this vision given? Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things he saw? Who's sitting on that throne? Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeshua HaMashiach is the one sitting on that throne. Like the appearance, so what we see is that the also the appearance of his waist and upward I saw as it were the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. What did we, what does Yeshua have? Behold coming with the clouds every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. On the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who, Yeshua, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Hold on. So then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And what is gird about his chest? And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and gird about the chest with a what? Golden band. Let's go ahead and go back. Like the so, and also the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. We're seeing here in Ezekiel, Ezekiel is seeing the same Yeshua that has this golden sash around his chest. And the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around. Okay, so now let's go back to Revelation. And his head was, and hair were white like wool and white as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire. And his feet were what? Were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Many waters. Hmm. I wonder if that sounds strikingly similar to the three voices. Like the noise of many waters. Like the voice of the Almighty. A tumult like the noise of an army. And his feet were what? Were appearance of fire with brightness all around. With a garment down to the feet. And his feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace. And his voice is the voice of many waters. Wow, some striking similarities. Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. And what was the covenant that God, and I mean, if the Almighty is here in Ezekiel and also there when Jesus is sitting on the throne there, then it could be said that the person that gives the covenant to Noah is Yeshua. And like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. In a cloud on a rainy day. What is the sign of the covenant of Noah? When you see a rainbow set in the cloud. So was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice of one speaking. What is that word for one? That, that word for one is debar. No, sorry. Wow. The word for one is ihad, and it is strikingly not here. Why they put one, I have no idea, because the word for one is ihad, and that is definitely not here in this verse at all. Let me see if it's up here in the Hebrew. It is not. No. Okay. So you can go ahead and ignore that one. I heard the voice of him speaking because we're talking about the voice of God.
a voice spoke. And I heard a voice that spoke is really what this verse should say. Okay. Um, Anthony, do you have anything to say about everything that we just read? Yeah. Well, the only, the only, um, the thing that when you were reading about revelations and Ezekiel about the satchel, um, I, I believe we are, um, to the best of Ezekiel's description and John's description is describing Messiah in his almost full dimension. And what I mean by that, because the Torah was written in, and, and it was it was tied in a satchel, the same satchel that is described when Ezekiel sees it around the waist and also when John sees it around him. So what we're witnessing is the word ultimately being manifested into the full dimension. And this is why we see all the descriptions and how we could even tie it back to the Bible, Noah, and we see the, the, the light, the unapproachable light and all of these things, the fire and, and the amber. I believe this is uh, the highest dimension of Messiah that we can visibly see written down. And I mean, it's going to be even greater than what was written down that we that we're reading right now, but that that's what I'm getting. Heck yeah, well, that's awesome. I I totally agree. Um, it took us two hours and twenty minutes to, to make it through one chapter. <laughs> I sure do. I sure do talk a lot. Um, okay, so obviously we're going to be doing one chapter per session because my big mouth can't shut up. <laughs> so we'll be doing one chapter uh, per session. But um, hopefully that was a good chapter. Does anybody have any questions? I, I don't have any questions, but I... I I had an experience one time that looks really similar to that. Um, so what Ezekiel was, uh, was seeing? Well, no, the one in revelation, I would say. Oh, okay. Okay. Because I, uh, but, but it's just, anyway, I, I'm just going to share real quick where I Go ahead. Saw, You're good. You're good. This is your time. Uh, I went into, I was just, I was repenting, 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 repenting. I was just, you know, at this point in my life, I had no idea not to do this. I just was begging for forgiveness. After a long time, I, anyway, I, I, a couple of things happened, but I ended up going through a wormhole. That okay. was similar to the wormhole you'd see in Stargate. And then I ended up in this, 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 this room at least initially it was it was a room that looked like you know huge stones in the walls <clears throat> not not like any stones you would see here unless maybe you were inside a ancient pyramid or something you know okay there was no light i was the light i was very dim at that point and um and then I saw a light up against a wall. And as I thought, I went to it. Now, mind you, I open up my eyes. I'm in my bathroom still. I'm, in, I'm having a, a multi-dimensional experience. I'm totally awake in my bathroom. And then I'm, when I close my eyes, I'm in this place. And I can see everything just like I'm in my bathroom. Crystal clear. So anyway, uh, I, I put half my body through, through that light. I don't remember what I saw in that light. I'd actually met somebody that I believe was on the other side of that light that I was introduced to at one point who had the experience of seeing somebody come through the light like I did and then go back out of the light. That's very strange, but that, that also has occurred. Anyway, when I, when I, when I came out of the light, I, I had a thought. I said, you know, Father, I still feel dirty. Then fire came from beneath me, the lower half of my body, 
was fire, which is similar to that lower half of his body being in flames. Okay. Then after the fire consumed for as long as it did, which was a long time, then at one o'clock, I saw a throne and on the throne, a man who had a crown on his head and a scepter in his hand. And he was had white hair, no expression on his face whatsoever. We didn't, we never spoke though. We looked at each other for a, a very long time. I, I can't say how long it was, but it was like, you know, 15, 20 minutes long. I mean, like very long. And then from beneath his throne, a bunch of stuff happened. Light came from beneath his throne and flowed from his throne and filled me up for a very long time. Then it rained and, and, and then I didn't, I, I didn't know better. I left. But my whole life changed overnight. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> so. Yeah. So the reason why I'm here is because I'm so, I, I, some, some things happened and have happened continuously throughout life that I'm, I'm, I can't, I can't get away from. <clears throat> anyway, I'm done. Hey, thank you for sharing. Um, that was awesome. I actually have multiple other people who have told me very similar experiences to what you're explaining, especially the bottom half being on fire. Mm. Um, I have a couple of people who over the years that I've been very close with that have told me very similar experiences that I also have kind of similar experiences with as well. So I 100% believe you saw everything that you saw because not just you, but many other people in the body of Christ are starting to see these type of things in this age that we're living in. We live in the best age to be alive <laughs> by no, far. Um, I want to see revelation unfold. I want oh, yeah. to see it. I want to I want watch to see God's it. kingdom here established. Amen. 100%. That's going to be so awesome. It's going to be so awesome. There's nothing greater. Oh, thank well, you for sharing. I it's appreciate already, that. It's already here. It's already it's established. Already, it, oh, no. It's already in us. So guess what? It is here. That's why I say it's, it's, it, was, it, was, it was here. <laughs> it's, about to, it's about to it manifest really is. from within us. Come uh, on. And you know, remember, remember, God sees the end from the beginning. He says, you must believe it already yeah. has occurred in order for it to be so. In, in, in truth, and in, in my experience in it has been when this whole thing happened, he showed me how our words are so powerful. And when, when I began to speak only the words that were absolutely the truth, not what appeared to be true, my word right. gained power very, very, very swiftly. And I was, I was, uh -huh. and, and, and then my, my, my faith jumped dramatically by speaking only the fullest truth, the highest truth possible. What I also found was when I spoke only the highest truth, remember he says, keep your eyes fixed on me. Yes. How, how, how that came to me was keep, keep your eyes fixed on me means do not waver. Hold on to that image of who I am in Christ and do not allow one thought to come again. So the example that, that, that Yeshua gave us when he was up on the, up on the high, you know, when he went, it, as soon as he got baptized, the spirit took him immediately into the wilderness and he overcame. Instead of being 40 years, he was 40 days, right? But he right. showed exactly how to overcome by, by, by speaking back to the thoughts that, 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 that try to ultimately get us to agree with less than who we are because that's the only way that that the devil can do it is 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 to manipulate us into speaking death into our lives to speaking something that's less anyway that that's might, might have been too much to speak right now but i'll, I'll shut up now. oh no you're good man we we love that so what nah, you just that, did yeah that's gonna that's gonna bless some people that watch this later so awesome amazing <laughs> what a way to end our study for the night that's awesome man. <laughs> i appreciate Hallelujah. you so much <laughs> that's it's 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 it, it was it was uh yeah believe me it's 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 worth it i uh, but there's so much more anyway well um 
Does anybody else have questions as well? Okay, if nobody else has a question, Robert, I got a question. Um, would you be interested in praying us out? Sure. Awesome. Lord, hallelujah. We just bless your great name, Father. We thank you, Lord, for the manifestation of the sons in the earth right now, Father. I thank you that you have given us wisdom, discernment, and understanding. You have given us your spirit. The fullness of Christ dwells in us now, Father, and is manifest. So I thank you, Father, for, for, for manifesting the life that you have for us through us, Lord, that as we have this co-union with you, I just thank you, Father, that we, we are your glory as we walk on the earth this day. Father, we are your honor. Father, hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for every single bit of wisdom and knowledge that you're giving through this call. Thank you, Father, for bringing all of the ones that you want to learn from this and also add to it. That this, Father, this call, this time frame can literally be stamped right now with your ring, be sealed and powerfully attract all that is in your scroll right now in Yeshua's name. Thank you, Lord Father. Amen. 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 Good prayer. Amen. That was, that was you, you and Heather, you guys, you guys are really good at praying. <laughs> you, you guys are really good at praying. <laughs> I like it. I love it. Um, okay. So um, for everybody, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, but for everybody watching, um, what a, what a way to come back to the Zooms. That's a, that's a, that's a good Zoom. Super excited. We'll be coming at you with um, we made it through a chapter of Ezekiel. Yay! I'm surprised we even made it through in three hours. <laughs> but thank you, Yeshua, for this study. I appreciate everybody that came, and thank you guys for watching. I am going to end the recording now, and then we can talk after.